very interesting afternoon presentations as well. Um, and these two presentations, uh, we will start with the first one, which is uh, Beyond Learning, Pushing the Limit by Professor Zarani Wati Abbas, uh, advisor of the Zeta Academy in Malaysia. So thank you very much for coming to Bangkok to speak with us today, and we appreciate uh, your help. It is, it is good to use the microphone because it's a lot easier to, um, uh, to follow. Also, it's being videotaped. Okay, okay. We're videotaping the presentations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have a small cozy group. And um, the, A students. the A students, correct. <laughs> what about the back? What about the back? <laughs> All right. The title of my presentation is Beyond Learning, Pushing the Limit. Uh, when I say beyond, or what, let me ask you the question. What do you think beyond learning means? Okay, that's one, uh, one good answer, yes. What do you think beyond learning refers to? Being a more complete person, yes. Be, ha having reflection or making reflections. Okay, very good. And that's exactly what I meant and more, of course, uh, because what I think I'm, I'm more of, um, you know, a lot of lecturers are behaviorist uh, practitioners. Uh, I try to move away from behaviorism. Behaviorist uh, practitioners are usually lecturing. I try to move away uh, towards uh, uh, cognitivist, uh, but mostly constructivist, and at times, connectivist. Okay? <laughs> All right. Um, I am... Um, I have been through uh, several kinds of learning environments from traditional universities. Uh, and then today, uh, well, uh, most recently in the last 12 years or 13 years, I've been at the Open University in Malaysia, uh, teaching online, 100% online courses, uh, mostly postgraduate students. And they come just like your students from all over the world. Yeah, and it's fun actually. And across time zones, not as many time zones as yours, maybe just up to about eight. I've never experienced 16. <laughs> okay, now the picture is a building, an old building in Penang. It's one of the heritage buildings, and um, they've been restoring some of these old buildings. And one particular row I found was multicolored, you know, for, for just one of them. And this is what it is meant by you know, going beyond, you know, beyond, beyond what we are used to doing. And I thought this was interesting, although some people may disagree, uh, painting a heritage building that color. The same thing goes for this car here. Notice the shade is different, so doing something different. Um, when we talk about um, educating our students, we usually think about preparing them for the working world. Um, and I found that, um, and uh, I found that in general, employers are saying that the graduates are not up to the mark, or the graduates are not who they are looking for. They don't have some of the qualities. And um, when I looked at, when I googled, I found that. Now, am I pressing the right right thing or not? No. I think I just turned it off. Okay. Uh, okay, this one. Uh, from the Job Outlook 2016 um, reference, these are the qualities or the attributes that they want in a graduate. So they are basically skills, yeah? Leadership, ability to work in a team, communication skills, problem solving skills, communication skills again. This is written, this is verbal. Strong work ethic, initiative, analytical skills, flexibility or adaptability, technical skills, and so on. Um, and again, um, uh, from another website, and this is the uh, Asian correspondent website, the top five qualities or skills that they look for are ability to work in a team, making decisions and solving problems, communicating verbally inside and outside of the classroom, 
ability to plan, organize, and prioritize work, and ability to obtain and process information. So what does that mean? Our courses should enable the graduates to do all these things. And we have to build in the necessary activities or um, maybe even assessment so that they're used to doing all these things. And <clears throat> when I conceptualize um, this uh, beyond learning um, term, I think it should start with this. When we design our courses, I mean, all of us are lecturers. Um, we always think about creating the syllabus and then creating, you know, topic by topic, what activities and so on. Uh, we think, I think we should design to produce the learning. Design with the, with the uh, um, thought of producing the learning among the students. We can teach, but does it mean that the students learn? Not necessarily. Unless we design in such a way that we produce the learning. And how do we do this? Through the learning activities, through the discussions that um, um, Dr. David was saying, that Dr. Ford was saying, and uh, through some other assessments uh, and so on. And uh, when we design uh, to produce the learning, if we go, uh, if we think about learner engagement, how to engage the learners with the learning, not how to engage learners in viewing the videos, but how to engage them with the learning process, then I think we've got it right, okay? And because learner engagement very often leads to deep learning if we do, if we do it right. And uh, of course, when they are doing deep learning, together with all the other skills that we um, inculcate, like the teamwork skills, the problem-solving skills, the critical thinking skills, then they become employable, or more employable, yeah? not necessarily. Again, it depends on some other factors like personalities and so on. And uh, we also, um, when we do all this uh, deep learning, eventually they also get this lifelong learning skills, so they become lifelong learners. And um, once we have a group of lifelong learners, we become an educated society because they continuously le learn, they continuously improve, and of course, knowledgeable citizens. And then of course, even we repeat the process of having them go through all this, I mean, we become better and better um, as a society. And, and we are able to contribute. Of course, in today's world, it's a one world schoolhouse. Anything and everything is out there for us to just take and learn from. And that's a challenge, actually. So some students, they don't like the, the, the lecture's materials, will go into some other lecture materials, uh, which may be good, which may not be good, depends, yeah? Okay, it used to be like this, maybe in the 50s, uh, and then when I went to the university, it was like this. Sometimes we see this still, right? We still see this, right? But is this a right environment for today? To, to come up with those employable uh, skills in the graduate. No? They're saying no? So your classes are not like this. Your classes are smaller. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that some universities are going into smaller classes. So that's a big step. Okay, what I wanted to do uh, is um, not to provide content, but to provide uh, some thoughts for discussion or maybe to have dialogue in your own heads, yeah? Uh, we could have a dialogue among ourselves as well, uh, but basically that's the intention. From A to Z, if we talk about beyond learning, from A to Z, I'm gonna propose a few concepts, or a few, uh, uh, call it pedagogy, or call it uh, resources, right? learning resources or learning tools. And the first one for A is authentic learning. What is authentic learning? Moving from behaviorist to constructivist from behaviorist learning to constructivist learning. So providing an authentic learning environment where the students are not given just lectures, but given lectures, but asked to think as well, to construct the knowledge along the way. That may involve changing of assessments as well. And of course, we all know this word or term, blended learning. Blended learning is a blend of pedagogies, a blend of online and face-to-face, a blend of you know, met methodologies, assessments, and so on. Um, and the good thing about blended learning is they supposedly say that 
it's good to be able to cater to different learning styles. I mean, just one of those uh, rationale. And then um, collaborative learning. When we do collaborative learning, we have students work together. And that's again the teamwork. It builds that teamwork skills and maybe even problem solving skills depending on what we have them do. And um, here it says Web 2.0 tools. I think the next speaker will talk about social media and collaborative learning is a result or can be the result of using social media. Yeah, so I wouldn't talk too much about this. I will leave it to the next speaker. And uh, deep learning is something that most Asian countries do not do. Correct? <laughs> You're not going to say anything. Because a lot of uh, learning is by rote. If they can um, recall what they learn and just cough it out in the, assess uh, in the examinations, uh, they, they get their A's. But uh, I think some of us do not believe in that. We want them to be able to think, to, to, to you know, somebody said uh, critical thinking, you know, and so on. Okay, experiential learning. The, in the university that I last worked, which is called the Samporna University in Jakarta, we consciously tell the lecturers to provide experiential learning. So a lot of the classrooms are 25 or less, and uh, the classrooms are full of activities because we want them to learn by doing or through hands-on activities. So that's an example. Or even go through field work, or even have internship programs, practicums, and so on. Flip learning. Uh, I've mentioned, I've, I've heard a few times yeah, that flip learning um, is uh, something that's been adopted in Thailand. I was in Chiang Mai two days ago. A few people mentioned flip learning, and again here, flip learning. So I think maybe it's not, that's not, it's not necessary to explain it, but flip learning allows, if it's done properly again, if it's done properly, allows for deep learning. Because you get the students to watch the video, or a video, typically a video, but we need as a lecturer to, to ask them to think about something in the video that they see in, in, in real life or that they, that they can uh, think about applying. And then in the classroom, get them to move beyond the video, the content of the video, and do some other things. So if it's applied correctly, then it will work. I think it was it this morning. Somebody was saying um, flip learning was done, but then the students do not watch the videos because in class they get a mini lecture again. So of course when you do that, it doesn't work. <laughs> yes? So sometimes we do flip learning, but not in the proper way. Gamification. Now, I don't think gamification is for deep learning, but it's good to get the students' uh, interest or to motivate them, to get them excited or attracted to the topic initially, or to get them to be engaged you know, with the content, but it's not necessarily um, uh, something that will bring about deep learning, uh, but something to, to, do, uh, to think about doing anyway. High-tech, high-touch learning. I think some of us have heard this. And um, <clears throat> again, when we design and implement the learning, uh, to me there are four aspects. Institutional readiness. Some institutions do not know what is good pedagogy, do not know what works better than others, um, and sometimes they just don't really care about producing uh, adequate infrastructure, for example, or good learning space. Yeah. Then we are stuck with traditional learning. And then the other thing is to provide, um, <coughs> excuse me, if we involve learning designers, we want learning designers who are practical oriented. <coughs> Let me get this uh, water for a while. And then the other thing is, um, if we are the uh, lecturer, um, we should ideally become facilitators. <laughs> Thank you. And I think in this room, everyone knows what that means. I won't go into it. <coughs> in fact, maybe there's a dialogue that we can go into uh, when we look at this high-tech, high-touch. And learner readiness. Um, I don't know whether every university has a course called um, 
similar to learning skills, learning how to learn, learning how to become a college student. Sometimes that's offered in the first semester, right? So if we have that, then I think <coughs> we can prepare learners to cope with whatever um, method we want them to be engaged in. Any comments on this? <coughs> I see. So you mean you mean to say that your students are not exposed to study skills anymore? <coughs> right. Yes. Correct. So that's that's what I think. Uh, we have to get them ready, and 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 it could be a course or it could be one week um, a series of uh, sessions and activities to get them welcome week. Yeah. make notes, you know, so all this part of it, you know, how to do case study, how to read the case, so the whole week we are basically preparing them to study. Yeah. yeah how to, mm. uh, how to yes, referencing, <laughs> referencing, yeah, that's right. So I find that uh, this course is quite uh, helpful to have our students go through, because if we are going to change our pedagogies, then we have to change uh, the way they do things. Otherwise, they'll just follow what, however they were uh, doing in the school, and which is basically rote learning, right? And then they get lost if they have to go beyond it. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. When the new university is easy to do, yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> and the older ones, then they will. Some of the older ones will complain. Why do I have to go through when they've been teaching for twenty, thirty years? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then infographics. Now, infographics uh, is. They are nice things to to look at or to to use as a re learning resource, but sometimes. We can get the students to produce the infographic. That means they do the research and they do the infographic. Then we also keep them up to pace with, with some of the latest uh, uh, way of doing things, yeah? Creating infographics. <clears throat> and there's so many free tools to do this. Just-in-time learning. Students, we cannot avoid this. Students will always do this. They'll just study, you know, they will study just in time. They will do things, assignments, just in time. Sometimes even asking for extensions, right? So. <laughs> So then we just have to think, okay, um, we have to think in, in uh, uh, you know, to think that, okay, that sometime, there are some things which we can suggest to them to do just in time learning, just before our lecture or just before an activity and so on. So because they will want something like this. <coughs> yeah, but I see. Do you know, are you familiar with Parkinson's Law? Uh-huh. Have you heard of Parkinson's Law? The work expands the time allotted for the assignment. <laughs> Yeah. So the work is all of a sudden expanded, right? One of the things that I use to get students to hand in assignments on time is I use Blackboard. I do all my grading on Blackboard. All my assignments are on Blackboard. I set up every assignment throughout the semester, and the assignment disappears when they walk into class. And they cannot, they cannot hand it in late. And, and that really, really does increase the amount of assignments that I get on time, almost 100%, almost 100%. That's good. That's also um, uh, creating the skill of, dis I mean, creating the discipline. Yeah. 
the which which they need yeah which they need uh, I mean time management as well and all that and stress management of course right having to pace themselves earlier so those are the some of the skills that the employees need um, among our graduates and of course I mentioned earlier today that uh, earlier just now that um, um, we need this uh, educated um, um, individuals and once they're educated they become knowledgeable and hopefully yeah we get a better society or we live in a better society okay learner engagement <clears throat> I think you mentioned a few times yeah about engagement uh, I I in particular like to use this model I found this model a few years ago maybe six seven years ago and I actually apply this model when I go into my online when I do my online forums and I find that it works because it's it talks about teaching presence sometimes we think we being a teacher already there in front of our students we think that's all there is but actually there's more to it um, especially when it's online and you're talking about every Monday posting I never tried that I didn't think that every um, a certain day of the week you post something I just post something whenever I'm free you know but that's one thing I will adopt <laughs> every Monday or every Sunday I'll post a message uh, or an announcement to the students online and um, so the teaching presence is more than just posting but the teaching presence is about connecting with the students about um, um, touching their hearts so they feel that the teacher is there for them and when we do things uh, we, f we, we make them learn so there's a teaching presence it's not necessarily that we give them a lecture we create activities asking them to read asking them uh, to discuss, asking them to view something, and then, and then to post their opinions. You know, I mean, that, all that element. That's a teaching presence, and then the social presence is when the students feel comfortable going online, um, do, uh, communicating with each other, um, uh, posting their opinions, and 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 responding to another person's opinion, so they feel safe, basically, and then they feel that they are in a good group a congenial group, a community of, a learning community that uh, is, is uh, positive online. And then, of course, the cognitive presence. <clears throat> okay, I forgot that I've already got this in. Extent to which participants contract meaning. Cognitive presence is when the activity that we create allows them to uh, be challenged adequately, mentally. So then they learn. Okay. All right, next, uh, MOOCs. And of course, we all know what MOOCs are by now. So much discussion about MOOCs. Um, but there are so many ways that MOOCs can be used. Uh, some people mentioned earlier that uh, they can be used as flip learning, for flip learning, or they can be used to, um, I, would use, I would use it in such a way that the students go into a MOOC to get some information or to get some other learning in addition to what they get from me. Um, I mean, it's always good, and it's not it's not like uh, compulsory, but you know, leave it to themselves. If the MOOC is good, they will go in. I cannot push them to do uh, to enroll or to to participate if the MOOC is not so well designed. I mean, it's not very good. It it gives them stress, unnecessary stress. Yeah, only if it's a good MOOC. And new literacies. Okay, this is where uh, I want to. I, actually, I don't even have to play because I know all of you are good in this. Basically, talks about the uh, communication skills, about the problem-solving skills, about the research skills, presentation skills, and whatever else. Yeah. So these are the new set of literacies that we need for the 21st century, and we just have to make sure that all our activities, uh, or tasks, or assignments, um, um, uh, are, are done by the students, uh, so that they get all these uh, skills. And then OERs, again, uh, was mentioned by the f uh, keynote um, yesterday. Instead of us focusing on developing our own materials, maybe we can pick up an OER that is equally useful if we had to do our own. Uh, I would go for this. Uh, in fact, I use a lot of YouTube videos to convey content that I would convey, and that helps save me time. All I focus on is what they're supposed to do after watching the video, or what they're supposed to pay attention to when they're watching the video. So there could be uh, printed materials, there could be, uh, as I mentioned, videos, there could be slides, and so on. And then pedagogical design. Um, 
Very often, um, this is being done by most people. Uh, when, we, when we could actually um, uh, have our students work towards this. So again, the employability skills go up uh, when we bring our students into this column. Can you agree with that? Do you do that? Do most of your colleagues do that? Not yet, yeah? Correct? Not yet, yeah. A little. Well, quite, a bit. quite a bit. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, maybe lecturers uh, modeling after what their lecturers were doing. And they don't know any better, apart from being the uh, sage on the stage. And, um, um, and then again, it depends on, I think, assessment. Because how they assess will be how they will learn. If they're being assessed for content, then that's how it will be. But if they're given scenarios where they have to pull in principles and concepts and then apply for the scenario given, then I think they will move. So it's up to the lecturer to make the change, but it's up to the university to institute a policy. Then that will be a faster change to me, yeah? in, in Asian context especially. OK, we talked about learning engagement earlier. <clears throat> When the, st when, the, when the students are engaged, they will be satisfied in the end. And in, in open distance learning, this is what we go for, engagement and then satisfaction. Because if they're satisfied, then they finish the courses. When they finish the courses every semester, then they graduate. Uh, in ODL, uh, the attrition rate is what, 20 plus, 30 percent? So we want to try and increase this. So again, um, there are many elements uh, in there cost facilitation, the learning space, how we create this, learning resources, what is it that we provide and what we ask them to do, and then the infrastructure, is it adequate access, easy to access, easy to download, you know, things like that, and how the course is facilitated, and all the, um, I mean, these are the aspects of uh, pedagogy. And uh, in, in an ODL institution especially, or maybe in new universities now, or in universities trying to engage in new methodologies such as blended learning, they should actually have someone there, uh, like an instructional designer or learning designer, to help um, lecturers change. So those are good universities. If they're serious, they will have this person on board. And of course, the, the lecturer becomes um, a facilitator rather than a lecturer, and, um, and, and, the, and the institution needs to be able to support uh, all this so that there will be learner satisfaction in every which way. And of course, the learner uh, has to be orientated in, in terms of having that uh, learning skills course. Okay. <clears throat> there could be um, online discussions, whether it is for on-campus students or whether it is for distance learning students. Uh, these are just uh, screenshots of the courses uh, that I teach. And uh, one of the rubrics that, um, well, the rubrics that I use is 20% um, of the course. Um, the, uh, I look at frequency and I also look at quality of contributions. So at the end of the semester, I just click on the student's name to see what and when he or she has posted. So then very quickly you can gauge you know, between one student and another. So I just go along that and just follow the, the rubrics here. Okay? If it's like this, then two points. If it's like this, one. Uh, rarely or never, so just zero. And this is told to them from the very beginning. So they cannot fault us for you know, um, being nasty or anything like that. Rubrics are great. Yeah. Everybody yes, so the expectations are clear from the beginning. Yes. Questions, a cue for questions. So to me, questions are the answers. If we ask our students questions, they will have to think instead of us just giving them the content. So every now and then I ask them questions, and, um, and uh, if they don't respond, 
I asked them again, maybe help to break them down, uh, help to break the question down so that they can, uh, will find it manageable. But basically, ask a lot of questions to your students. Don't, t don't ask the students, do you have any questions? <laughs> right? We, we, I see, okay. All right, so again, now all this is about providing student-centric learning. The student is the center. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So if you look at this, uh, I mean, just to share with you, I mean, for s most of us, it's just review, right? So uh, with student centric learning, we are going to be able to provide the personalized learning, student owned learning, deeper learning, anytime, anywhere, and competency based. And of all this is for that. <clears throat> Teaching style. Um, this is an interesting quote. If a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. Well, that's questionable. Sometimes we have to have them change. So, um, you know, get them to change because we want them to be more employable. We want to have a better, to live in a better nation, right? In a society, you know. Okay, ubiquitous learning, of course, um, 24 seven. Um, it is situated and immersive and uh, it could take place whether it uh, whether it's in the traditional classroom, uh, that could take place from the traditional classroom in a virtual environment. Is that correct? Okay, it should be in both, right? Okay, so you have formal learning methods and informal learning methods, but twenty four seven doesn't matter who you are. Uh, you can go from um, um, for informal learning, it will go higher if you're. Uh, you know, if you work towards the expertise, and um, again, if you go with formal learning, learning methods, ubiquitous learning um, is more, right? Is, is that what you're saying? Okay, <coughs> again, using ICT, we have so many devices, so basically any device, uh, using cloud-based uh, resources or tools or systems, uh, using resources from any institutions and accessing from Anywhere and anytime. So whether we're on the bus, on the train, even in the car, and whatever else. Okay. Virtual learning environment, uh, we can learn, uh, we can have our students learn anything uh, virtually. Uh, I find that my students are using Facebook a lot. So I use Facebook uh, as well as the learning management system. And uh, it's faster through Facebook. Sometimes they communicate with me. I think all of us experience that. We get messages anytime, right? And, but the thing is, with Facebook, it's very quick to respond. If it's LMS, you have to sign in, you have to, you know, so many steps. So let's use, you know, social media. I think you're going to talk about something interesting as well. So right now, we're in the Web 4.0. Web web um, uh, face. Um, I think Thailand had what education 4.0, so we can agree that you know we all have to work towards uh, this uh, stage. And again, remembering that we have um, younger generations uh, in place. I think on campus we have what the Y and the Z coming in, Z coming <laughs> this year. <laughs> okay, so we just have to realize that the Z generation prefer handheld devices for communication. And they're expecting maybe down the road, Google Glass and 3D printing. And uh, the Generation Y, tablets and smartphones, as well as social media. Okay, of course, uh, well, this is all about financial decisions, but we, get, we just talk about this too. Yeah. And then in terms of career, they are, they are, they are multitaskers. And for them, they're digital entrepreneurs. <clears throat> just to re to remind ourselves where they are. Okay, and then some summary. In conclusion, we have to provide the centralized. Uh, we have to move away from centralized learning to student-centric learning. Student-centric learning is when the student decides what to learn, when to learn, you know, and usually just in time kind of thing. So we provide all kinds of materials. Um, you know, all this. There are many things that we can provide these days. And of course, transforming from push to pull learning. And again, uh, putting it all in one slide. In the 21st century, if we think about beyond learning, 
uh, we're pushing the limits so that they actually learn. And we, as facilitators, produce the learning in them. So that's my conclusion. And uh, I hope, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you very much for listening. is that students' attention span is so short. I, I do a lot of things you do, like new videos. I change topics every 10 minutes to try to keep them going. But, 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 but students' attention span is becoming so short. How do you cover more difficult topics that take more than 10 minutes to really talk about after they faded away 10 minutes into your discussion about it? Well, how do you, what, what do you do? Okay, I, I have been teaching students online. Um, so I don't get that ish, uh, problem anymore. But I think if I were to design um, um, for that kind of uh, students, maybe get them involved in activities or give them ask them a lot of questions based on what they're supposed to know, I mean, based on what they've read. That, that's what I would, I would try. <laughs> Zarani, yeah. can I yeah, ask please, you a question? Please, um, I'm, I'm intrigued in your choice of rubrics because the first one was on frequency. And one of the problems I've had in online classes is that if you reward frequency, they'll break up something into lots of pieces to increase their frequency score. So uh, I, I, in fact, say, look, I expect a normal contribution, maybe 100 to 200 words. And then I basically say to them, uh, but I'm going to judge you by uh, where you fit within the solo taxonomy. So you're looking at the complexity of the responses and the way in which they link and construct their knowledge and their response, uh, both within their own thinking, but also to the rest of the class, because everybody's usually in this together. So it, it's really a quality measure, but it's also a, a measure that that gets them thinking and realizing that they can't just produce a response. They've got to actually make it all link up together. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Um, in the Open University of Malaysia, for all the undergraduate uh, online discussions, sometimes they just say yes, sometimes they just say no. I agree, I don't agree. And that counts as frequency, yeah? Um, for my, because I don't teach the undergraduates, I deal with the postgraduate students. Um, I don't think they are, f they are bothered so much about the frequency because I think these are mature learners. And, and some of them are vice presidents, some of them are heads of you know, managers, you know, some of them have PhDs, but doing a master's uh, in instructional design and technology because they want to take their college uh, distance. So we, we're getting mature learners who, who actually, when they respond, can, uh, and end up responding uh, one to two pages uh, of postings uh, in length. And then it's not very frequent. It's not, it's not necessarily once a week, maybe once every two weeks. But, um, but I guess it depends on who the learners are. But I agree. <laughs> if it's undergraduate, they are, very, uh, they are very good in doing that. And sometimes we find that they copy another person's uh, st uh, response and just paste and post. So yeah, but your suggestion about seeing the quality in, in the way that, that you said it, I think that's good. There's another level up uh, to go into. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for the uh, suggestion. Okay. Okay. Th thank you. We, we have it. Okay, thank you very much. Very, very interesting presentation. And great slides, too. Enjoy those slides. Share slash my first name. Okay. okay. okay.